PodcastOne.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I'm coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today, and we have a classic case of what is called over here in Southern California, June Gloom. I'm on the Wikipedia page for June Gloom. I'll read you two sentences. Well, it's one sentence. June Gloom is a Southern California term for a weather pattern that results in cloudy, overcast skies with cool temperatures during the late spring and early summer. You know, a lot of people out here in Southern California can't stand June gloom because it's gray. It's a little bit cool. It's a little bit windy. I like it because in Southern California, you got the best weather probably anywhere in the world that I've been anyway. I ain't never been in Hawaii, but they got some badass weather out here. And that's probably my favorite thing about living in Los Angeles, the fucking weather. And I particularly enjoy June gloom. Because you get about 30 days, and you get a little bit of it in May as well, May gray as they call it, but the June gloom, 30 days, the sky's kind of cloudy, uh, it's a little bit misty, it's like a marine layer comes over the city, man, it's awesome. And you can go out in the valley now, and it'll be sunny and hot, but you get over here close to the water, and you got that June gloom going on. A lot of people don't like that shit, they get depressed, not me. Shit, we got about 320 days of sunshine out here in SoCal, out here in Los Angeles, so we get enough sun. Shit, I'm like a damn albino. The UVA rays and the UVB rays beat the shit out of me. So finally, when you can get a little relief from the sun and you get this nice, cool, overcast gimmick weather called June gloom, shit, I like the shit out of it. So June gloom, shit, as I record to open this podcast, it's June the 6th. How many days are left in the damn month? Pull up my calendar. We got 30 days in June. Hopefully it'll probably last a little bit into July. So I got some more cloudy days to look forward to. Let me close my calendar down, man. I got my calendar up. Uh, We've been planning a little vacation. My wife and I, my illustrious wife and I, Kristen, are leaving tomorrow to go to Santa Barbara for a couple of days. Santa Barbara is about an hour and a half. Shit, which direction is it? I guess it's north. Anyway, we're going to go stay at uh, eh, some gimmick hotel up there. I think it's going to be pretty cool. My wife wanted to take a vacation and get a break from the dogs for just a second. We're only going to be gone for two days, so it ain't much of a vacation. I ain't taking a vacation in... I don't think I've taken a vacation in 20 or 25 years because I don't term anything I do a vacation. When we would go down to the Broken Skull Ranch, we was going down there to work our asses off. Now, I also enjoyed being down there, so a lot of times you could consider that a vacation because other than the podcast, I wasn't technically working, but I was working my ass off on the ranch doing a bunch of shit, and that was my passion. We had fun doing that, so this is going to be an interesting little getaway. My wife has someone, one of her close friends that she's known forever, coming to stay at the house to take care of Hershey, Mula, and Callie. This will be the first time that we've ever been away from our dogs since we got Cali. They go everywhere with us. Take them to the ranch with us. Take them to uh, Nevada with us when we go see our in-laws, all that shit. So we'll probably be worried about those motherfuckers and probably won't even have a good time because we're thinking about the damn dogs. So I'm looking forward to getting around up there in Santa Barbara, poking around a little bit, see if I can find me an antique shop, maybe a shop that has some neon signs or some porcelain signs, some collectibles. I've been trying to doctor up this house over here and hang some shit over here and get my studio going. But what I got to do first, I think, is paint this place and uh, turn it into my man cave, and it's going to be the official home of the Steve Austin Show. I've had a couple of guests come over here. Uh, Brian Kendrick came over here. Pat Melitich came over here. Most of the other people were at 316 Gimmick Street and uh, have been on the phone. So 
This new setup I've got over here for my studio is kind of a clusterfuck right now. I don't have any furniture in this house other than my podcast table, my two chairs. I've got some camping chairs here, the kind you just fold out when you're in an RV or something like that if you go to the beach. Hell, I got about two or three of them out. If someone comes over here and they got a posse, I ain't got no room for them because all I got is a couple fold-up chairs. I got Gallows and Anderson coming to the podcast here in a couple of weeks. I was talking with Carl Anderson the other day and Luke Gallows. I said, fuck, I said, you guys going to come by yourself? You're going to bring a posse with you because I ain't got a stick of furniture up in this motherfucker. He said, no, man, we're coming by ourselves. I said, well, good, because I ain't got no room for a bunch of bullshit over here. Some other superstars rolling into the area that I have uh, lined up on the schedule. I don't want to drop any names so nothing fucks up and don't get them here. I know that Gallows and Anderson are going to come here because I talked to both of them on the phone and they're looking forward to being on the show. And I'm looking forward to shooting the breeze with those guys. As long as they've been around, all that bullshit they've been doing over in New Japan with the Click and all those world-class workers over there. We're going to sit here and watch this second hand on this Pearl Bear Neon Clock spin around like a rotisserie chicken, drink some beer, and shoot the shit about the business of professional wrestling. So that should be an outstanding endeavor. Speaking about Gallows and Anderson, man, it takes me back to that South Paul Regional Wrestling shit they did when you had Tex Ferguson, played by Gallows, and Chad Too Bad, played by Carl Anderson. <laughs> Man, that was some good shit. John Cena was awesome as Lance Catamaran. God damn. I hope they light that shit up again and do some more episodes of it. Because I think they, what, they did like four of them, maybe four or six. Fandango was great as Cena's sidekick or Lance Catamaran's sidekick. Uh, Rusev was awesome with that chicken promo. That was just some good shit. So anyway, I'm rambling here. I'm looking forward to talking to those guys. And uh, they're coming over here soon. Uh, I got to go over and get ready to pack all my shit up to go to Santa Barbara. On a side note, I loaded up Hershey the Wonder Dog, my prized possession. Goddamn, I've had that dog for, she well, she's 13 and a half years old right now. And I bought her from my buddy when she was a year and a half. So I guess I've had Hershey 12 damn years. And she's starting to slow down a little bit. I took her to Unleashed, that little gimmick dog store, and put her in one of them silver tubs and gave her a bath today. She was dirty as hell. I didn't think she was dirty, but my wife wanted me to clean her up a little bit. So I took her over there, shampooed her ass, and I took her over there in the Metallic P 2003 Ford Focus, 64,000 original miles and a little bit of change, rolled up there in that four door. And that thing, that little car, God damn it, it's fun to drive. I just wonder if I get in a crash or something with one of these idiots texting and, you know, smoking their cigarette, driving down the road to have their head up her ass. I'm worried about getting in a crash when I get in that little Ford Focus, that little motherfucker. I like driving my pickup truck and that other shit around because you sit up a little bit higher. But, man, we had a good time over there. I let her, she wandered through the aisles, and she picked up a chew bone, so I bought that for her. Got some dog food while I was there, so the lady that's going to watch the dogs can feed them and all that stuff. And I'm looking forward to getting down there and taking a little trip and getting out of Los Angeles. I dig living in Los Angeles, but the problem is I ain't got no getaway valve yet. I don't have an escape valve. And so I'm still looking for Broken Skull Ranch 2.0. Sold that place two, three months ago. What was it? Anyway, I've just been uh, stuck here in this concrete jungle, and I like L.A., but goddamn, I'm from Texas, and I like being outdoors. I might have said this on the Tuesday podcast, but on uh, Sunday, I went back to the uh, Broken Skull Challenge compound. I unlocked my storage containers, and I drove around my Kawasaki mules to keep the batteries charged. And Man, I tell you what, i got to find a place somewhere whether it's here in california maybe in west texas maybe nevada that i can just get out there and ride my ass off on my damn mules because that's what i like to do coming up this weekend i'm going target shooting with lynn thompson over at cold steel knives they're the guys that make the broken skull and the working man knife and uh god dang it's fun shooting with lynn because He's really competitive, and we're not out there competing. We're just out there having a good time and being extremely safe and shooting steel targets. 
and there's nothing like the sound of those steel targets when you hit one like you're supposed to. Then we'll uh, get out the shotguns and start shooting skeet. They've got a skeet thrower. They'll throw multiple skeets, so we'll get those things to cross. And i tell you what, I never was worth a damn at shooting those skeet until I dialed in last time with Len and the gang from Cold Steel. So I'm looking forward to getting back out there. Hell, it's been six months at least since I shot with him. And uh, I picked up a couple of different shotguns to take out there. I got to go by the uh, sporting goods store, give me some shotgun shells. I guess I'm going to shoot some, what, seven and a half shot, two and three quarter inch, 12 gauge. But that's all the shit I got going on right now. Hey, man, before I get into the body of the podcast with Pat Militich, I got to remind you guys and you gals, hey, man, if you in shape, if you have a competitive bone in your body, if you like to compete, if you want to prove to the world how tough and how bad you are i got a show for you it's called steve austin's broken skull challenge and we're going to start filming right around the back end mid-july it's going to be hotter than shit out there the other day when i was driving my mules it was only 81 degrees and it felt like it was on fire so by the time july gets here it'll be about 90 95 and the heat will play a factor so if you don't want none, don't come get none. But if you do want some, come out because we got plenty of getting for you. Badasses only apply. We don't need no sissies. Hey, man, let me get on with what I got to do here. Pat Melitich is my guest. We're going to jump into the body of that podcast. But before I do that, I got to hook you up with the latest WWE Slam crate from Loot Crate before we go any further. The next crate in their bi-monthly series has been announced, and you only have a few days left to order it before it's gone. This time, the theme is stables. Why stables? Well, Loot Crate thinks a team of two is great, but a team of more than two is even better. So the stables crate pays tribute to the WWE superstars who band together and become forces of nature. So sign up at LootCrate.com slash Unleashed by June 15th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time so you don't miss out. Because once this crate is gone, it's gone. And don't forget to use the promo code Unleashed to save three bucks off your order. The Stables Crate is loaded with great items you'll only find from Loot Crate. And this box features stuff from the likes of Triple H from his days with DX, Sasha Banks from the Four Horsewomen, and Bray Wyatt of the Wyatt Family. And, of course, there's an authentic T-shirt you can only get in the WWE Slam Crate. And there's a second action figure of the Attitude Series line. So sign up now at LootCrate.com slash Unleashed and do it by June 15th at 9 p.m. PST so you don't miss out. And remember to use my promo code Unleashed to save $3 off your stable Slam Crate now. That's LootCrate.com slash Unleashed. And use the promo code Unleashed to save $3 off your crate. But do it by June 15th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time because once this crate is gone, it's gone. Hey, it's Shaq. And with the NBA Finals in full gear, you know we're all over it on the big podcast with Shaq. Can the King bring another title to the land, or will Steph and KD make history again? We got to cover like no one else. Plus, the biggest guests from sports and entertainment, tons of life, and the top stories every week, all summer long. Just go ahead and crown those champs. The big podcast with Shaq, with a new episode every Monday at Podcast One. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. Hey, uh... Tonight, as we speak, now this podcast will probably play Tuesday or Thursday, and uh, I want to talk about your podcast one more time, but uh, tonight you have an endeavor on Access TV, which is? LFA. The LFA, the, the uh, Legacy Fighting Alliance is what they call it. It's a combination of legacy, joined forces with the RFA. They've combined all their talent, tons of talented kids. They've put a ton of people into the UFC. There's a lot of talented guys on the card, but more than anything, um, you know, it's kind of an end of an era for Michael and I, Michael Chavello, my, my broadcast partner, he and I have grown to be very good friends. Again, both Masons, we've gone to lodges all over the country and sat in lodge with Masons all over the, the country. Uh, just formed a really strong brotherhood, a friendship with him, and he's a super intelligent guy, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. And, uh, yeah, he's going back to Australia to raise his family. He's going back to Australia for yeah, Vegas? Yep, he's going, going back home. His wife and, and son are already there. When? Uh, he's leaving next week. So he's flying, ah. flying back next week. So tonight's our last broadcast together. I'm, you know, I'm happy for him, but the selfish part of me is is really bummed out because we we had so much fun on air together. We really did, man. So why is this the last one? He just, you know, decided, hey, time for me to go home. 
You know, he's, it's cool when somebody can end their career on their own terms. It's not very often somebody can, and he's not ending his career. He'll continue doing stuff over in Australia. But to end employment with a great company, Access has treated us very well. Um, to just say, you know what, this is best for my family. It's not about the money. I'm going to go home, raise my kids in Australia, where, where we belong and where, where we're happy and where we want to be. And, you know, so, so it's pretty, pretty cool. It sends a pretty good message to people that are paying attention. So then will you continue your stuff with Axis? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That could be a new broadcast. Oh, partner. dude, we'd have a blast, wouldn't we? Huh? <laughs> I don't know shit, but hell, I can just chime in every here and there. <laughs> That'd be cool. That'd be cool. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Um, so then what's next for you? I've got two weeks off, and we'll be doing uh, – we're setting up some law enforcement military stuff throughout the summer also, but I'm training for a lead bill also, so I've got that August 19th. That event? August 19th, Saturday yeah. morning, starts at 4 a.m., and you've got to be back across the finish line by Sunday at 10 a.m. You've got 30-hour limit to go out 50 and come back. And uh, so I'm going to try and get that damn belt buckle. You know, the, the uh, ultra running, you know how they got the belt buckle thing right. that you win? You know how they, how they figured out how that happens? How? Really cool story. Guy uh, was doing a 100-mile race. Uh, it was a horse race. And the guy's horse got sick, came up lame, and so he had no horse to ride. So he said, hell with it. I'm here. I've traveled all this way. I'm going to do the race on my feet. And everybody, you're going to run 100 miles. He goes, yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to. So he did it, and th those horse races, those 100-mile races, they used to give out bell buckles, so they gave the guy a buckle, and that, thus the ultra marathon was born, the 100-miler. Hey, man, here's one for you, and I, I think a uh, uh, manager, one of the greatest managers in his wrestling, Paul Ellering, does the Iditarod. Okay. I think, well, hell, is that every year? Right. Or is it like the Olympics? I can't remember. Why don't you do the Iditarod? Right on the back of a sled, dogs pulling you, high adrenaline, got to navigate some shit. It could be right up your alley. You're not, you're not <laughs> off the ground. You know what? I don't, I don't know if I want to stand on the back of a sled for that long. I, I'd fall asleep on the damn thing, right? <laughs> At least I won't fall asleep running. That's, that's all I can say. Hey, man, before we leave, I, I want to give a shout-out to Michael Chevello. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough when uh, Michael gave me a call to be on uh, uh, The Voice. One versus. of the greatest episodes he's ever done. God dang, man, I had so much fun. I rolled in there. I was a little bit burned out, and I was like, you know, if I, I knew who Michael Chevello was. Yeah. And I, I rolled in there, and then, man, all of a sudden, you know, he, really, he got me so engaged in the interview, and, man, we had a blast. So it was probably the best interview that I've ever been given. I give a shout-out to, to Michael Chevello, The Voice. And just a super cool guy, and yeah. just the way he conducts his interview, does all his homework, super prepared. Yeah. He's a top-notch guy. Yeah. It's, it's going to be – Yeah, I, I'm sure you will miss him. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And that's, that's like I was saying, he really truly researches for his interviews. And I think his two favorite of all time that he ever did was you and Dan Gable. Oh, man, that's a pretty damn cool company yeah. there. Yeah, that's uh, his two favorite uh, a interviews. A wrestler versus a real wrestler. Well, hey, it's, a, it's all wrestling. Hey, the the, uh, the Conspiracy Farm podcast, uh, who you got coming up next? What, what, what kind of uh, material are you going to delve into? You know, Sabelle Edmonds, uh, I think we're, we're going to have on next. Sabelle Edwards is former CIA, and she's got what's called, um, she's written books on Gladio B, which is the second Gladio. Operation Gladio was um, in Europe. For those that aren't familiar with, with what Gladio is and the stay-behind armies during the Cold War, the NATO stay-behind armies were... Uh, citizens who were secretly trained by our our intelligence people and European intelligence uh, to fight guerrilla warfare against the Russians if they were to invade Europe. After the Cold War ended, there was no necessarily need for them, but what there was was a threat politically by the communists of slowly creeping in and taking over Europe. So what they did was, and this stuff's all documented, and there's been a lot of people assassinated because of it, and there there is court documentation of this stuff, um, you know, suddenly an explosion at a at a fairground. Suddenly, a, a, someone bursts in and shoots a bunch of people, and they start in the news media blaming it on the communists. So they turned the public in the in the in Europe against the communists, um, and even the thought process process of the communists to keep that type of political situation to, from from creeping in and controlling Europe. Um, so that was glad that was the original Gladio Operation Gladio. And uh, if people can go on YouTube and, and watch documentaries about it and learn what really goes on behind the scenes, and that's why there's talk of false flag events and all this other stuff and Gladio B potentially happening here in the United States. So you've got to really pay attention about, you know, what, what's really going on and, and the type of attacks that you're seeing. And, and I'm not saying that false flag attacks are a regular occurrence or anything like that, but they do exist.
Dude, you come up with some of the damnedest subjects. I mean, well, you just research, you know. And, and I'm telling you, a lot of this stuff, once you open the Pandora's box, Steve, you can't close it. That's the problem. Right. Once you're a truth seeker and start opening the box, you well, can't close it. Yeah, like you said, a truth seeker. Yeah, you can't close the box. And it's tough, man. It's, it's tough. I'm it keeps... seeking a truth, Pat, but I've been hitting to have so many steel chairs. God <laughs> <laughs> I give a shit. Obviously not as much as you do. But I really enjoyed uh, episode 30, the, the episode you told me to listen to. Yeah. And so listeners can find your podcast. They can, find us, on, they can find us on iTunes uh, under The Conspiracy Farm on YouTube even. They can go and listen to it. Um, we've had some amazing guests on there. Just Sonny Pozikas was, you know, the former Spetsnaz guy. He was, he was hunting terrorists his whole life, you know, down in Chechnya and, and the stands and all that stuff that bordered with Russia. This is a true bad, bad dude. This, this, and now he's an American citizen, um, loves training um, Americans. Uh, loves giving giving out his knowledge, and the guy the guy really knows his stuff. But we just have a really eclectic group of people. Peter Schiff, who's a, a genius when it comes to uh, global markets and, and money and how the, how the system works. We had him on, on I think our very first show, and he educates. He was the guy that got laughed at on TV for calling the 2008 crisis is coming a year before it happened. He goes, I'm telling you. And the, the other economists that are on CNN with him are, are going, dude, you're high. What are you talking about? Yeah. I've never seen any of those economists on TV ever right. again. So, yeah. It's interesting that you speak the language of all these people that you're speaking to. I just try to keep up. You know, the, 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 there's no way I'm going to know what Peter Schiff knows, right? right. I'm, there's no way I can be that, that good at that stuff. Um, I, too, have been hit in the head a few times. <laughs> but, <laughs> no doubt. But, but you know, I can research a lot of it and at least hold a conversation with them and, and let them educate me even more. And I, I love being educated. I love learning. Hey, uh, when you left the Octagon to where it's at right now, right now, what do you think about just how it has progressed? Right. Evolved. You know, I think, I think it has progressed in a lot of ways. The athletes are, uh, many, of, many of them are, uh, because there's more money, there's some better athlete, athletes getting into it. They're, you know, guys that would maybe choose boxing from a childhood standpoint now choose wrestling to go into and will wrestle in, uh, all through high school, college, and then go into MMA. So you're getting some pretty scary, scary people coming in. I still have problems understanding how people aren't well-rounded. Some guys are really good strikers and terrible grapplers or, or vice versa. The guys just can't maybe grasp the striking, the rhythm of it, things like that. It confuses me that there's still that going on in the sport. But, but overall, I think you know, the sport's getting much better. I wish, I wish that there were two or three major organizations so that the fighters had somewhere to go. Uh, Bellator, I think, is getting much better. And athletes come out of our shows and go to Bellator or go to the UFC equally. So that's a good thing, and I think Viacom is starting to pay a lot more money to their athletes and to get the talent, the new guys coming out, which is nice to see. So that, that will help balance out the sport for the athletes, I think. What do you think when UFC sold? I thought $4 billion is, boy, the UFC did a good job of selling themselves for $4 because I don't think they were worth it, quite frankly. That's just my personal thought, okay? Um, but selling it for $4 billion – and I also thought maybe eventually the people buying this might realize they might have paid too much for it. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But. Well, it's, just, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it does in their hands. I mean, because, I mean, that, that business, like when you said, hey, man, it'd be great if there's another major player or two, and the same thing with pro wrestling. It'd be great if there was another major player or two, just yeah. so guys got more options and there's more competition between the federations to pro, make, make a better product. Absolutely. And that's just the way it was going back to the Monday Night Wars. Right. Uh, if you know any investors that want to start a major organization – I wrote out an entire plan, and the name alone steals back at least half of the control of the sport. What is it? I can't say it. I can't say the name. I'll tell, I'll tell you it off air, uh, but I'm telling you right now, every Google search would end up on, at my organization. Okay, a lot of guys, you know, when you get into business pro wrestling, they go, okay, man, I'm wrestling for about 10 years. I'm going to start my own promotion. Right. So, guys. <laughs> Guys do that. They get, a, <laughs> they get them a damn ring and start riding, running some small towns. They got no TV, right? So they end up going belly up. Yeah, you so, got to Yeah, you, you got to have the contracts. You got to have the TV contracts, yeah. definitely. And you know, here's the one thing that I would say to people is, is, I was an athlete for a lot of years, right? I competed. I saw it from those eyes. I was a coach for a lot of years. I had done some small shows. I had promoted. I uh, my manager had promoted shows forever. He's done more shows than anybody else on the planet called Extreme Challenge. Monty Cox was my manager. I've worked on the TV side. I've seen it from that side. So I've seen it. I've, I've refereed a thousand fights. I've, I've judged fights before. I've seen it from every possible angle, I think. 
So I understand it from all those different angles. And I think that, you know, if somebody were to come along and start a, start an organization, you know, where I see grocery store chains in Iowa that are employee owned, you get stock options in the company. That's the thing that needs to happen for athletes. Give them stock options and owning the, this thing. You, look, you, you stay committed to us and don't jump ship. You'll end up owning part of this company by the time you're done, right? Things like that need to go on. What, what do you think goes into someone being able to sell pay-per-views at the top of a card? Well, I tell you what, the only guys that can do it are either such phenomenal athletes. You mean the athletes themselves? Yes. I mean, look, Chael Sonnen is one of the greatest talkers I've ever seen in the sport. And, it's, and, and um, uh, Conor McGregor can do the same thing, right? He, he can sell it. He can sell it. Yes. And very few people are capable of that. You understand it because you did it for so many years, right? So there's only a few guys that really have that talent and can back it up. There's, that's just the way it is. For me, when I was coming up in the sport, it was under so much scrutiny that none of us could do that. Right, as much as we wanted to to emulate a Steve Austin, we couldn't do it because the sport was under so much scrutiny. Right. I was doing televised debates with politicians who were trying to shut the sport down, and every politician by the end of the debates um, would say to me during the debate, "Yeah, I got to agree with Mr. Militich. He's he's right. He understands the st- statistics." I, you know, I'd look at a politician and go, "It's not about safety. If it was about safety, you wouldn't be having little league baseball because seven kids die a year in that sport." So don't tell me. I go, uh, 20 to 30 boxers die a year globally. So it's not about safety. It's because you're not getting your cut. That's what it is. And then he goes, you know, yep, yeah. pretty much. It all comes down to money. I go, so you're going to still try and ban this sport when it has not, you sit there and try and sell it on safety, and you just admit on TV it's not about safety at all. It's about the money. I go, this is disturbing. It's very disturbing, the kind of shit that we had to deal with. So I couldn't go out. And, and talk in front of a camera and, and get all pumped up and do my – I had to be, you know, as much of a gentleman as I could to try and keep the sport alive. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, yeah. Man, it's interesting uh, because, I, you know, going back to the, the growth period of the UFC to what it is right now, the money curve, right. you know, has – when when, it, when did that money curve really start? Ten years ago? Well, I mean, Shamrock and Tito, when they fought each other, got paid good. Okay. They definitely made some good money, yeah. So I'm not sure exactly what year it was they first started that those two went at it. But I think that was the first, like, mega fight. You know? Right. And, yeah. and same thing. Whether it's football, baseball, pro wrestling, same thing. Right. You know, the, as it grows, you go through that curve. Hey, man, guys out there, you know, a lot of guys, well, in the early football days, guys are playing for nothing. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Then, you know, now, I You're mean. getting destroyed. You, when these guys that are still around, and think, God dang, a dude's making 20 man a year. For, and, and I did the same shit, and I was better than him. Yeah. But it, just the money wasn't there back in the day. Right. And, you you know, you played football and were a very good football player, and you know how much punishment. I mean, running the ball, that's the most brutal freaking – I mean, that's the brutal position, right? You're getting blasted by everybody constantly. That shit is hard on the body. I saw a lot of guys – I've had friends in the NFL, and those guys are never the same. They, they, if they play for a good number of years in the NFL, I mean, some of them, some of them uh, are so addicted to painkillers and all the other stuff because their bodies are so ravaged that I just look at them and just go, man, it's just – is it worth well, it? Well, the sad part about it is they're less than 30 years old. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they're already done. Yeah. It's going to be in, uh, interesting to see what Adrian Peterson does this year as he signs with New Orleans. Yeah. Splitting uh, reps with um, – was it Mark Ingram, I believe, who I really love both running backs and particularly Adrian Peterson. Yeah. And I think he's a stud athlete. I think he's going he's gonna to be – he's kind of exception. I believe he's 32. But I expect that guy to have a big year. But to your point, with the beatings that those guys take and the running back position – has also been devalued because it's such a throwing game these days. Yeah, you yeah. Know, quarterbacks and receivers. Well, obviously the quarterbacks are making the most money, but the receivers are making big time money. Mm-hmm. Running backs are hard to get paid. Right, right. Um, I just, you know, I played fo- football was my first love. I mean, I loved football. I played nose guard, right, in high school, and we had you weigh one sixty five. But I, ba- yeah. but I was benching three sixty five back then. I was strong. Oh, really? Yeah, I was a pretty strong guy. Yeah. So they just wanted me because I was quick. If, a, if if the guards pulled, I was in the backfield. I was causing havoc, all that sort of yeah. stuff, right? And it was my, I, I knew for sure growing up that I was going to be an Iowa Hawkeye linebacker. I knew it. 100% was going to happen. All my brothers are huge. They're 6'4". They're 6'5". Giant dudes, great athletes, fast, can dunk like friggin' machines, do whatever they want, right? I didn't grow. I stopped growing. <laughs> and, I, you know, I was a good football player. I mean, I felt that I, I definitely, if had I been bigger, I, I definitely could have done it. But I, it broke my heart. And I remember um, leaving college. When I left college, my mom got sick with heart problems, left, left school, came back home, and I was working pouring concrete during the day and then bouncing and bartending at, at bars at night, things like that. And I remember sitting 
in that house, in that basement going, man, something, there's something out there. I'm destined to do something. I can't, and I, I still feel like I'm looking for it, to be honest with you. But back then, it was just like, this is not my destiny. This can't be it. I, I was supposed to do something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure you thought that way, too, your whole life, right? Well, you know, I, when, when I was uh, in, you know, seventh grade, that's when you, you could first start playing organized football in Edna, Edna where I grew up. So starting in seventh grade, go through high school. Man, I got through high school. I weighed 205 when I graduated. Man, I was a running back. Played running back and linebacker. Right. But, man, I was slow. I mean, 4'9". That ain't great. But I was a north-south runner, runner because run I, people I over wasn't basically. fast enough to, to run east to west, so I just ran north and south. Yeah. And then, uh, boy, I thought, man, every Division One school was going to come down to Edna and you know, pick my ass up. Right. I went to junior college. And I, I went, told my mother's friend, I said, hey, Evelyn, I'll go to junior college, make All-American a couple of years and go D1. Shit. I went to junior college and found out there's some real badass football players that might be a little bit slow on the books, have dyslexia yep. or some kind of learning disability, yeah. but they can flat out play some ball. Yeah. I didn't even make all conference. Nonetheless, I got a football scholarship. But at the end of the day, you know, I blew my, I blew my wheel out, and uh, that was the start of my knee problems. Right. Uh, I started working on the freight dock, and then the rest was history. I saw a commercial on TV, got into a wrestling school, and, and took off. Star for a couple of years, and had a pretty good run. Yeah, but, uh, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I knew the right was on wall, but I'm the biggest football fan in the world. Do you still watch to this day? Dude, I, I can't. I don't even have. I don't watch TV that much. Well, I, I don't know. watch TV either, but right. right now I'm watching the playoffs. Right, right. You know, Golden State just smoked Cleveland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, I saw I saw some of that game last night. It's like I don't watch sports anymore until it's a championship or something. Oh yeah, well, it's, well with with football because it's a short you know, sixteen games. I, I got to stay tuned to that. Right. Uh, baseball, one hundred fifty two, six two, whatever it is, and then ba- basketball. That's too many games for me. Man, right. That's short attention span. Yeah. I'm watching the playoffs are here. So the playoffs are here right now. So I'm digging that. Speaking of fights, did you see that little altercation between? I think well, it was Bryce Harper and that pitcher. Oh, yeah. Where Bryce they were... got, hit him. He got hit with the pitch right yeah. the hip. Yeah. Charged him out. He threw his helmet. Big miss with the helmet. Yeah. And then the pitcher caught him with the shot coming in. <laughs> I'm like, dude, double leg that guy and do something. <laughs> you can't run to the mound and get it and eat one. Right. Yeah. No, it's, I feel, I feel kind of bad when I say, because when I was young and I'd watch fights before I knew how to fight, like really fight, you know what I mean? I was a tough kid, wrestled, things like that, boxed a little bit. But when I'd watch fights and see people smacking each other, you know, you're like, oh, shit, you know, they're fighting. Well, now when I see a fight, they'll be like, Pat, you need to go in and break that up. Like when I used to bounce, they go, Pat, you got to break that up. And I go, why? They can't hurt each other. Look at them. This is hilarious. <laughs> and so I just wait till they got tired and then just drag them apart, you know. <laughs> you know the thing, a lot of people, you know, someone get into a bar fight, man, they just gas out and just blow up in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. When you start windmilling a person, I mean, in your attempt to fight, right. you're exerting full force. And you ain't been doing nothing but either drinking or smoking, mm-hmm. you know, for the last you know couple of years. Doesn't last long. Doesn't last no. long. Uh-uh. And like you said, yeah, I'd be lucky if someone gets hurt. I tell you what, you know, I'm sure you bounced, right? No, I never bounced. You never I, bounced no, in, I was in a club? club getting drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so I bounced in a bunch of clubs, right? And we had uh, the guy that owned the bar. He goes, Pat, I think I'm going to start hip hop night. I go, dude, do you know how many gangs are in the Quad Cities are going to show up to this thing? Do you realize what you're going to do? And he goes, it'll, it'll be fine. He goes, we'll have bouncers. You know, you'll be one. Yeah, I'm one of the bouncers. I got to pull this. I got to, I got to try and keep this under control, right? So anyway, the first hip hop night, a couple of gangs are in there and they start fighting, and I'm trying to break it up, and they attack me, right? So now I'm getting attacked, and this guy puts me in a headlock, and it's it's winter out, and it's it's cold out. And he had me in a headlock, so every person that was next to him who was trying to hit me, my head was kind of protected because his arm was around it, which kind of saved me for a little bit. Yeah. So I'd grab them by the lapel of their coat, and I'd pull them to me, and I'd put their head next to mine, so I was in between both these guys' heads, and nobody could get to me. And I'd choke them unconscious, and I kept grabbing. I choked like three people unconscious, and then I got out of his headlock and got behind him, put him in a rear choke, and went backwards out the door into the street, right, with him, until he went limp, and you felt his neck go, Grrr. All these vertebrae yeah. pop, right? So he goes unconscious. I drop him on the concrete, and I'm out in the center of a, f- a four-lane one-way with a snowstorm coming down. With uh, I'm back-to-back with like six cops. We're surrounded by over 100 people, and the dogs are on the end of their leashes, on their back, standing up on their back legs, barking, trying to bite everybody around us, right? 
So we're in, I mean, you know, those are the kind of fights that, that I was in <laughs> routinely in those clubs, man. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of good, uh, a lot of good street experience coming into MMA. I think. Well, you get a street experience, and you had an MMA background. So, like, if if uh, someone was to come at you with a knife or a gun, how prepared are you for something like that? It depends on the skill level. I've had a couple of people trying when I was younger try and stab me. I had one guy try and shoot me. I can tell you this: that if somebody has a knife, run. Just don't stay. Knives are unforgiving, man. Um, if somebody has um, a knife, get away from them. If they have a gun, get close to them. That's all I can right, tell people. Right. You know, and and you know, nothing's a hundred percent, obviously, right? I mean, we train people how to keep their weapons. We we teach people how to deal with with edged weapons. Um, we teach, teach cops how to use edged weapons. Um, the, the karambits are what I suggest. My partner and I are developing some, some new karambits that make it easy for that blade to karambits. be engaged. A karambit is, it's got an index finger loop on it, and it's, it's shaped like, almost like an eagle's talon uh, pointing away from you, the grip. Um, so when you hold it, that loop around your index finger, you can find that in your pocket easy. And when you pull it out, there's that tooth on the back of the blade that catches on your pocket and engages that blade and locks that blade out. So you can punch with it. You can slice with it. You can wrestle with it in your hands. You won't lose it because of that index finger steel loop on it. Um, a lot of people are develop, developing the karambit loop now to have a knot on it so you can break a, break a window out if you've got to save right. somebody for cops, things like that. But it's a great tool for weapon retention to save your gun if, if your gun's getting taken off, you have things like that. So, um, but, yeah, knives, knives are, man, a no-go. I mean, if you took two knife exp- experts and told them to knife fight to the death and the winner was going to get a million dollars, neither one's collecting. They're both going to bleed out. There's right. people out there that will carve your ass up with a knife, and not a whole lot you can do about it. All right, I have to take a minute here to thank another fine sponsor of the Steve Austin Show, who also happens to be a close personal friend of mine and a member of the WWE Hall of Fame, Diamond Dallas Page. And if you haven't given Dallas' life-changing DDP yoga program a try, I don't know what you're waiting for. And I'm not telling you to do DDP yoga because Dallas is a sponsor. I'm telling you to give it a try because it's a damn fine fitness program that will get you on the path to healthy living and keep you there. It's a great choice for any age and any skill level. And there's no better time than right now to give DDP yoga a try, especially since Dallas is giving you all 20% off the DDP yoga DVDs, the DDP yoga now app and all DDP yoga related merch. Hats, T-shirts, heart monitors, mats, and more. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. The DDP Yoga Now app gives you everything you need to achieve your health and fitness goals. DDP's got tons of workouts, nutrition tips, and recipes, a way to track your progress, and even offers motivation for those days that you need it the most. The app also lets you access live workouts from the DDP Yoga Performance Center. And like I said, you get all that for 20% off by going to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. So get on the DDP Yoga program today and change your life. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That's ddpyoga.com slash Austin. If you're in the market for a car, then you need to check out True Car. True Car gives you pricing information you need to feel confident about your purchase. When you register a True Car, you'll see what other people in your local area paid for the car you want. And from there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. True Car shows you real pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing offered to you by True Car certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. And you'll also see all the dealer incentives before you get to the lot so you can feel confident about the price when you show up. True Car makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or used vehicle, and the stats don't lie. Over 3 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car certified dealer network. There are over 13,000 dealers in that network with some 700,000 pre-owned vehicles available. So do yourself a favor and go to True Car for your next car buying experience. True Car doesn't just make the process easier, it'll also save you some money. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. Do you know Paul Lays and me? Yeah, absolutely. Were you on? Uh, were you in when we were bouncers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first one or the second one? I think the first one. Yeah. Okay, because I read the book, but my memory is yeah. bad. Did, uh, I, I don't. Know, I can't know. I can't remember if I remember that story. Give me another uh, bouncer story because I read the uh, book eleven. It just came out with when we were bouncers too. Okay, Check yeah. it out. Uh, I just Paul got that Lays book. Paul yeah. book is just out. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. I'm still working on it. Paul, he's supposed to be on the podcast. Yeah, Paul's a great guy. He yeah, just sent me awesome. that book too. Yeah, he's a yeah. cool guy. And we met originally because I had a, a a stalker who was starting websites about me, um, and 
and doing all kinds of stuff and, and sending out emails. That, he would copy and paste my name in the stories about, like, uh, sex trafficking or selling drugs or this or that. And, Why? And just oh, because he, he worked for the Gracies for a little while, and he sued the Gracies, right? And that was his thing. He would get in with you. He was so intelligent. He had uh, two master's degrees. And I was so um, gullible at that time going into things, just never having dealt in big business, things like that, right? I'm just an Iowa boy, whatever. Um, so what he does is he, he'd lure people in, and then he'd file lawsuits against you. Well, I ended up countersuing the guy. I ended up winning a $2.1 million lawsuit against the guy. I buried him, but he was trying to ruin my life. He was a stalker, right? Right. So um, Paul Lazenby wrote a story about me and not knowing that this guy was the one generating all the stories, right? So I uh, messaged Paul, and I go, dude, seriously? I go, this has been my wife's. I, I bought a 200-pound mastiff to protect my family because of this psychopath, right? And Paul goes, oh, shit, I didn't know the story. So we ended up becoming really good friends out of that situation. I went up when I was in uh, Canada, hung out with him and stuff, and, and uh, uh, it's, he's really a cool freaking guy, man. Yeah. He's a lot of fun to hang out with. Yeah, he must stunt double on a couple of low-budget movies. Is he? Uh, yeah, that we did up there in Canada. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, would you shut that door right there in the front? He was my stunt double in a, a couple of movies that I did up okay. in Vancouver, and really, really nice guy. And when he shaves his head, looks a lot like yeah, me. Yeah, probably yeah. a little bit better looking than me. He's a big dude too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, he's got a pro wrestling background. He's got an MMA background, mm -hmm. so he's well versed. Yeah, yeah. And so we're doing this fight scene. I can't even remember uh, the name of the movie was Damage. Okay. And uh, so it's kind of a, like a montage fight scene, and so man, the, the director says uh, action, and boy, we go to fight, and I start swinging, and I'm just beating the shit out of Paul. He's taking all these punches. He's doing a wonderful job. And, man, I think I, I just sent like a swinging door. I think it was a swinging door left. And I just swung it a little wide, and my little finger just caught him right on the nose and pushed his nose oh, over about shit. an inch. And, you know, first of all, I never want to hurt anybody in a fight scene for a movie. Right. And I'm like, God dang it. And we become really good friends. I'm like, God damn it. And he just looks at me and doesn't miss a beat. He says, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I keep swinging for about another eight or ten seconds. You get through the fight scene, cut. And then right then his nose just starts gushing. Oh, sure. But it was great. I mean, we started laughing. <laughs> you know, we laughed our asses off because he's a very tough guy. Yeah. And been a lot of fights. So it was, it was just a cool, cool moment. Right, yeah. You no. ever doing any movies? I saw you had one movie credit. You've done more or not? I've done one movie that was a paul walker film called bobby z based God on the dang. book life and death of bobby z who was bobby z uh, bobby z was a it was a fictional book about a, a guy that was dealing massive amounts of drugs through the internet and all this sort of stuff right um so paul walker played bobby z in the movie and they hired a new director last second who was john hirschfeld who's a really good director yeah. out here you know john hirschfeld yeah. yeah he's a really good friend of mine and so john hirschfeld calls me up and he goes Hey, listen, this movie didn't originally have any fight scenes, but so I want to put fight scene in it. I want you to help choreograph the fight scenes, and I want you to bring some fighters that you've got that you think can do a, uh, a good job. So literally, we didn't do any training of the, the actors, of Paul Walker, of anybody for the fight scenes. Nothing was choreographed except the morning we were shooting, we would literally um, would would just make up the fight scenes as we went, right? And so... That's what we did, and, and Rory Markham, who was on my IFL team, who fought in the UFC, Rob Lawler was in the movie, Tim Sylvia, Ben Rothwell, Gan McGee, Chuck Liddell, so we were all in the movie, and we had a blast. I'll tell you a great story about Lawler. So Lawler's in the movie, and he's already died in the, in the fight scene in the desert, right? And I'm getting ready to fight Paul next, and we're standing on top of these giant rocks in the desert in Mexico, in Baja, Mexico, and the... True stunt coordinator comes up and he goes, "Hey, Pat." He goes, "I need you to come down here for a second. And I go, "Well, hold on. I'm talking to the director. I'm talking to John right now." And, and uh, um, he goes, "No, dude. You need to get down here. Rob Lawler's going to kill the assistant producer. He's going to fucking kill him right now if you don't get down here." And I went, "Oh shit!" So I ran. And I get down there, and Robbie's standing in front of this. Uh, Tony Adler was his name. He's a nice enough guy, but um, he pissed Rob off because they got Rob laying in the desert right all day, and Rob's sitting there screaming at him. He's going. Uh, the problem on the movie was nobody was getting paid. They weren't doing what they said they were going to do. They owed me like forty grand, right? Yeah. And they weren't transferring the money into my bank account back home. Every day they said, yep, we're doing it. They wouldn't do it. So I, I started talking to the, uh, to the accountant for the movie. I go, dude, do you realize that people are getting pissed off? Like everybody on this set 
is going to revolt and come to that office and kill you, dude, right? including me. So you better get that money into my account. My wife is pissed. And so he kept lying to me, right? So anyway, Lawler's pissed now because he heard me talking about this, and he wasn't getting paid either. So Lawler goes, maybe he's standing there in front of the uh, assistant producer going, maybe you didn't fucking understand me. He goes, you can put somebody else in my clothes and have them lay in this fucking desert. He goes, you're not paying anybody. He goes, I ought to beat your ass right here, right fucking now. And Tony Adler goes, well, hold on a second. He gets his walkie-talkie and he goes, can I get Rob Lawler's um, SAG paperwork up here right now? He goes, does that make you happy, Rob? And Rob goes, all right, again, maybe you didn't fucking hear me. He goes, I'm going to cave your fucking head in unless people start getting paid, right? And this guy's got sweat just gushing down. The poor guy's terrified, right? I go, Rob, just go for a walk for a second. And I talk to Adler, and I go, now you see, Rob's not very good at dealing with people who aren't being honest with him. I said, I got a little more patience, Tony, but something better happen here pretty quick. So anyway, I walk away from him. I go to find Rob. Rob's sitting in the back seat with Paul Walker's in the front seat of a, of a, a Suburban, a Chevy Suburban, and all the windows are down. We're out in the middle of the desert, and Rob's going, he goes, you motherfuckers in Hollywood, he goes, all of you live in make-believe, this is bullshit. He goes, people got bills to pay, none of us are getting paid, and Paul Walker didn't know anything of this. Right. And this is where, because he was getting paid. Yeah, and this, and so sadly, he's no longer with us. Right, and this is where Walker... Where everybody said he was a good guy, I'm telling you, he was a true blue solid dude. Because he goes, what? He goes, what do you mean nobody's getting paid? He goes, Rob goes, nobody's getting paid. He goes, Pat's not getting paid. They're not getting paid. He goes, the cameramen aren't getting paid. Nobody's getting paid, Paul. And he goes, oh, we're going to fix this shit right now. Gets out, walks up to the assistant producer, Tony Adler, and goes, if the money is not in these people's accounts by the end of this day, this movie is done. We are done. We are packing the semis up, and we are going back home. You understand me, Tony? And Tony goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Walker. So here's the funniest part, right? We're almost done with the movie. So we're like a couple days away from getting it done. So my wife, I, I said to my wife, I go, that money said, they said it's going to be there, right? So they, they owed me 40 grand, all right? They wire into my account the money, and my wife goes, hey, Pat, they wired in 400 grand into our bank account. They put too many zeros on it, right? So now, here's the account the next day. Rushes to the sack from the office 10 miles away. Holy, you got leverage now. <laughs> he rushes, and he, he drives, and he comes running up to me, literally. He's like panicking. and he goes, Pat, we accidentally sent you a little too much money. I go, yeah? Uh, I, what are you talking about? What are you, and he goes, we sent you 360000 extra dollars. He goes, can you have your wife wire that right back to me? And I go, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, she'll do it today. Yeah, I'll, I'll give her a call. Well, we didn't, right? I was just had to mess with him now because he'd been lying to me for five weeks on the set, right? Yeah. And so finally I'm like, yeah, now you're going to sweat for a while. So anyway, there were some people who still had not been paid, and one of them was a camera guy from Iowa who lived like 50 miles from where I live. And I go, you still haven't been paid? I go, okay. And so I told the accountant, I go, well, this guy, Jim, says he hasn't been paid. And there's a couple other people that haven't been paid. I'm getting their numbers. And as soon as they let me know that they've been paid, I'll go ahead and wire that money back to you. So I took off from Mexico. I flew home, right? And it was literally not till another week later that everybody had been paid. And then I had, had the money wired back to him just to make his ass sweat. Man, that's a cool story. It was fun. Man, did you not want to do any more movies? Was that enough for you? or You know, I'd never been asked, you know, to be honest with you. That was just kind of a... But did you enjoy it? I had a, yeah, I had fun. I mean, there's a, there's a hell of a lot of uh, hurry up and wait on movie sets. That's for sure. That part can be a little bit uh, unnerving. Yeah. But, but I like what Robbie said because he was right. You could add anybody there with a... Well, well he probably had hair back in you know, as he was younger. Mm -hmm. Whatever. But they yeah. could add a damn anybody lay there on his stomach, you know, halfway right. covered up in yeah. the desert. That right. would have to be Robbie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but but a lot of times, well, and like he he laid there for many hours because he didn't know no better, and that's what they told him to do. But you know, the more movies you're on, it's like, hey, this is bullshit. Right, right. Anybody can lay here. Yeah. You know. And Robbie's a sharp guy. Robbie's very quiet and soft spoken most of the time, but when he when he when he'd get mad or he'd act, like just like a bomb went off. I mean, when he when he did stuff, he did stuff big time. Like one time, uh, one of our guys, Tony Fricklin, who fought in the UFC that trained with me, was sitting on a bar. After a fight that we did, it was an outdoor fight, and, and Jens Pulver fought on that card and won by knockout. And we, he was sitting on the bar, and we were kind of just hanging out, celebrating the guys from the camp. And uh, it was in the Quad Cities where I live, but over in Rock Island, Illinois, a place called The District. And Tony's sitting on the bar with this really good-looking Latino girl. She's beautiful. And 
out of nowhere, Rob is suddenly leveling these uh, Latin King gangsters, right? Suddenly just, and so we just all jump into action, realize Rob's in a fight, and we start smashing these guys, right? And we knock them all out. They're all just destroyed. Yeah. And I go, Robbie, what the hell? He goes, dude, I was watching these guys. They were talking constantly about going after Tony because he's with the friggin' uh, one, of the, one of the little princesses from the Latin Kings, dude. She's like one of their girlfriends or something. So they were just getting ready to jump him and, and kick his ass, right? So Robbie's observant. He'll sit in the corner and he'll watch and be quiet. And yeah, sure enough, he probably saved Tony some serious problems on that. And and, and uh, rec- I mean, I'm serious, a bomb going off when Lawler would fight like that in a bar situation, just mass destruction, like and quick. You know, those guys had to wonder, holy smokes, why are these guys so tough? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, and, and you know how it is. It's like if you're picking fights with, I'm not. I've got cauliflower ears. I'm not picking a fight with a guy with cauliflower ears. I'm just not going to do it. I just, right. I don't want to be in that kind of fight today. No, thank you. But that being said, with the cauliflower ears, how many people? Okay, you, uh, you've uh, not been in the octagon for a long time. Mm-hmm. And okay, someone doesn't know who you are. How many people have you had come to a bar and? Try to start some shit with you. I've, you know, I still have people do it. You know, really? Unfortunately, yeah. I still have people do it. But I don't, the Okay, f- how do you d- diffuse the situation? I go, uh, I say, well, what, do you, what do you do for a living? You know, and they'll say, you know, construction work or whatever. And I just say, are you pretty good at it? And they go, yeah. And I go, I worked as a professional fighter for a lot of years. And I at one time held a world title in it. And I, I'm pretty good at it. That's probably the only thing I'm good at. And you're picking a fight with me. I go, just, just don't. Just, I don't want to fight you. I, I, don't. I used to get paid to do it. I don't like beating people up. I don't like hurting people. I don't like going to jail. And so it's just, let's just leave it alone. And usually they're in unless they're completely drunk, which you know, is what it is. But I had a guy try and pick a fight with me one time. And I was with my girlfriend at the time and some friends and their girlfriends. And the guy literally walked up and bumped him into me on purpose for no reason and started challenging me to fight. And I go, I don't just, I'm with my girlfriend, just go away, right? I, I don't want to get in trouble. And uh, because I had one time where I, I crushed a guy's face and I almost went to jail for it. And I had another time where I threw a guy down and he fractured his skull and almost died, right? Yeah. So I was done hurting people on the street. It was just too risky. And uh, the guy goes, do you even know who you're fucking with? And I go, no, who am I? Who are you? Who are you? And he goes, I'm Pat Militich, mother. Right? And I go, and all my friends break out laughing. And half of them fall on the ground laughing. And I go, you're who? He goes, I'm Pat Militich. And I go, <laughs> so I pull my wallet out and I get my driver's license out and I go, read that. He looks at it and it just instantly goes sheet white. And looks up at me with his mouth open and I go, take my ID back out of his hand and I go, are you going to leave me alone now? And he goes, yeah, it turns around and walked away. <laughs> I couldn't believe he did it. I, 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 out of I was, all the names he could yeah. pull out of the air, he says your name, <laughs> and it's you. Yeah, imagine somebody doing that to you and yeah. going, I'm Steve Austin, mother, right? <laughs> Just some dude that's bald and... and you're, uh, you're pretty good friends with Boss Rudin, right? Yeah, yeah, real good friends. You yeah. heard uh, the, the story between him and uh, Brian Erlocker back in the day. I, I, yeah, Erlocker. He was, he was, no, I wasn't, but he was going to beat Erlocker's ass. And the Erlockers didn't know who he was, right? Exactly. Yeah. And Erlocker started it. I mean, I like Boz, whatever, there was a mix up, and Boz apologized profusely. As you know, Boz is extremely polite. Right. And has enough wherewithal. I mean, he's been in a million fights. Yeah. And so he's not looking to get into an extra fight because he's been there and done that. And in his prime, he was one of the scariest humans ever. Still scary. Yeah. 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 But anyway, that was that was a good story. The Erlackers shut up pretty quick then once they well, figured it once out, Once everybody right? smartened him up. Right, right. Like, hey, dude, that's Boss Rootin'. And all of a sudden, that's, that slice of humble pie. Hey, let me yeah. <laughs> shake your hand. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's cool. <laughs> because Boss offered, boss offered to, you know, Brian a drink. Hey, it's cool, it's cool. Right. And you just completely did everything the right way. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, you know, Brian Erlacher find, finds out. Whole different story. Oops. One of those oops. Yeah. yeah. So I was in Rapungi in Japan, in Tokyo. Rapungi, Jesus. What happened? <laughs> I'm with Boss Rudin, right? Oh, no. It's, it's Boss and I in Rapungi. And almost, Did you drink back in? Into- yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we, had, we, had both fought on the, we had both fought on the card. I owe everybody a beer. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, we had both fought on a card, and we were out celebrating in Rapungi. And so all of a sudden, these big, giant Nigerians who were bouncers there come walking right toward me. They're staring at me, and I, I'm sitting there going, what are, these, 
what do they want with me? It's like they're going to kick my ass or something. Well, they walk up, and the, one of them goes, Mr. Militich. And these guys are like 6'6", six, six, just big dudes, right? Um, and one of them goes, Mr. Militich. And I go, yeah. And they go, can you do us a favor? And I go, well, okay, sure. You know, what the fuck am I going to say to these guys that kick my ass? And they go, can you please get tell Mr. Rutten to get off the bar? So I look over, and there's Boss with his shirt off dancing. Like, <laughs> he's over there dancing and drinking and stuff and having a good time. And I go... All right, yeah. Well, no, I said, I go, you guys work here. I go, to go tell him you got off the bar. He'll get off the bar. And they go, we're not going anywhere near that dude. Uh-uh. <laughs> These guys are scared to death of him, right? So I walk over, and I finally talk Boss into getting off the, uh, getting off the uh, bar, and, and then our man, my manager actually put us in a cab and paid the cab driver. He goes, take these guys back to the hotel and get them out of here. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I'm looking at you and watching you move your neck. Yeah. Then you, you ultimately left uh, the octagon or – retired from fighting i know one uh you're very dedicated to your wife and your family right so that was a concern but also there are some neck issues uh i had a c3-4 fusion uh some stenosis bone spur all that stuff right and, and i got spiked on my head an actual load and some you know just just some uh, nervous system problems right what was your neck issue that kind of did it force the hand or was it the family that made you say hey man I've been doing this long enough. Let me take myself out of harm's way so that I can take care of my family. Or yep. was it that conversation that you spoke of a while ago with Brian Stan? Well, it, anybody with one eye and half a brain would have stopped long before I stopped. I mean, when I had the initial neck injury, um, I lost all use of the left side of my body um, during that time. Everything atrophied, and I had to rebuild. I had three neurosurgeons tell me that I had to have surgery. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I kept saying no. I just said no. I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm just. And they said, you know, we need to f fuse these these two together at the time. Now C5, C6, C7 have all fused together on their own naturally. I never had a surgery, um, but I was actually paralyzed from the neck down twice in training. Uh, one time I was grappling with a guy, and my neck got jammed back. Anything whiplashing, I would have problems with okay. at the time, and so I just went completely limp, like. I just fell down like a sack of potatoes and said, oh, my neck. And then uh, another time I was sparring with one of my fighters. I was training for my last fight against Thomas Denny. And I, the original injury when I heard it was training for a fight with Frank Trigg. I was going to fight Trigg. And uh, so anyway, I, I got hit by an uppercut the last time that it happened. And it wasn't a hard punch or anything. It just was the, the quick whipping back of the head that snapped my neck and I went limp again and, and I was done and I remember laying there and not being able to move and saying, you know, you're a complete dumbass. What are you doing? You know, this has got to stop, man. This has got to stop. And so I, that's, that's right before my last fight. So I went out and I did that fight like that, right? I had come back from it. My, my arms were working again. I had atrophy. This arm's still atrophied. You can yeah. see it's smaller than this yeah. one. Yeah. You can see the muscles twitching and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, I got the same thing. Yeah. 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 So, I said to myself, I can't get hit by Thomas Denny at all. And it's not like I was worried about getting hit by him at all before if I would have been healthy. But because of my neck the way it was, literally, I didn't want to get paralyzed. And so he never touched me in the fight. He never hit me in the head. And that's about the, I don't know, a minute or so into the second round, I crushed him with a right hand and knocked him out really, really bad. It was a really violent knockout. I actually felt bad about doing it to him. Um, but that, was, that showed me right there that if I really didn't want to get hit, I could have been doing that my whole career. And I never got knocked out in sparring and boxing, kickboxing, right. anything like that. Um, but I didn't, I really didn't need to get hit like I got hit throughout my whole, you know, my whole career. But explain this to me. You just said you hit him, with, I think, with a nasty right hand and you felt bad about knocking him out so, so bad. I mean, I, I, how do you say that? I mean, you were a fighter and. It, it ruined him, though. It, okay. it, it, really, it really ruined him. I mean, he but was. But that's not on you. No, no, not necessarily, no. Okay. Um, I just never, you know, it wasn't, I didn't like fighting because I liked hurting people, you know what I mean? I got you. I, I like competing. Yes. Um, so um, with him, he had such a horrible concussion from the, from the, from the knockout that uh, Frank Trigg had him on his, his radio show, I think. And it was two weeks later. And he asked him, he goes, um, how hard does Militich hit? And he goes, dude, he goes, I still have a massive headache from it. He goes, it's really, really bad. Um, and I, every time I see Thomas, I just, you know, he's a, a real nice guy and stuff. So, yeah, I just think, well, I really fucking hurt him. You know, it's, you don't, you don't want to hurt people that bad. I understand that. Yeah. I, I, the way you put that, I, I get it. Yeah. You have to have it to win. Right. Uh, you're not out to kill anybody. You just get the win and fight. Right. And, you know, perfectly healthy with a solid neck, I probably could have done that gone out, put him on the ground, submitted him or done whatever I wanted to do type thing. But 
because I had to end it with like right. just one brutal shot because I didn't want to get into a, a trading punches because my neck was so bad. So does it limit you uh, in any way, shape, or form with respect to physical activity now? You know, it's not it's not real stiff. It's not too bad. I mean, I can I can still turn my head, things like that. I can still do CrossFit workouts, pull-ups, all that sort of stuff, you know. So it's it's not too bad. I mean, my posture has always been bad from wrestling my whole life, I think. You know, so I try to run straight up and down as long as I can because that there's, you know, when you run on a 40 or 50-mile run, training run, and you're bent over the whole time, you know how bad that ends up hurting your hamstrings and your low back and everything. So I'm constantly trying to remind myself to stand straight up when I'm running, so... Tell me about these CrossFit workouts you do, because I host a show on CMT. We're about to start shooting on July 21st. It's called Broken Skull Challenge. So I get guys out there from and gals, right? Some of the best athletes in the United States of yeah, America. Yeah, it's an awesome CrossFit, show. Yeah. Spartan race, you know, tough mudder, uh, obstacle course racing. Right. But some of these CrossFitters, and and there's a couple of guys that are on the production staff that are CrossFitters. And man, the guy comes over to my little gym. I just got a power rack over there with some dumbbells. It's just a little Mickey Mouse setup. It's all I need, though. Yeah. And we're out there shooting. I live on set so I, don't, so I can avoid to drive. Right. And he goes, man, you ought to do some of this and this and this and all this other stuff. And I'm like, hey, man, you'll understand. And he goes, I, I've had two shoulder surgeries and, you know, this, that. You know, I've been beat to shit. Right. And he goes, oh, man, I had a couple of shoulder surgeries. You know, I still do it. I'm like, I don't give a fuck what you did. <laughs> you know, I don't care what surgery you had. Everything is different. Right. So what kind of CrossFits, and, and I respect CrossFit as far as, you know, uh, let me see. If bodybuilding is progressive resistance to build mass, I mean, just with respect to change the body composition and uh, get in shape, you know, with X amount of uh, uh, weight versus reps for a shorter period of time, that that's your goal. So right. it's a progressive, uh, you know, workout. Yeah. And you've seen tremendous. I love to watch CrossFit games every yeah. day. But anyway, my point is, or my question is, with you being somewhat beat up, what kind of CrossFit shit can you do? Well, I, I like kettlebells. I like med balls. I like all that stuff. And the guy that taught me that stuff long before CrossFit even existed, he came out of the Turner Halls, which were when the Germans immigrated to America, they started Turner Halls. And that's where they, in Germany, trained their youth to be um, um, warriors to protect the nation eventually, right? So if you're functionally fit, you can be taught to do anything, whether it's drive a tank, shoot a gun, fight with a knife. Uh, play football, do whatever, right? You're just functionally fit. You can run, jump, climb, do whatever you got to do, right? Yep. So that's what it was about. But he was the guy that was teaching me how to how to use kettlebells, how to use med balls, all that sort of stuff. Indian clubs, you know, the club swinging, hey. all that, big, the big malls, all that sort of yeah. stuff. He was teaching me all of that stuff way back in the day, and I've still got tons of that equipment, right? And so that's the stuff that I always like doing. But one of my like favorite road workouts, I did it. A few weeks ago, this one, I tell you what, tell your CrossFitters to do this one. It's 15 burpees, then you run a mile 10 times. So you do 150 burpees and you run a total of 10 miles and do that workout. I did it in the hotel like yeah, three weeks ago or something. That's a freaking great. That's Where'd a, you run the mile at? On the treadmill. On you the just treadmill? get on the treadmill and freaking haul ass and get done with that and, and then get back, get back off, do your burpees, get back on the treadmill, just keep going back and forth. It's free, and it, it can go all the way down to a quarter mile if you want. Do 10 burpees, yeah, do a quarter yeah, mile you. 10 times yeah, yeah, just to get started. You know what I mean? How long did that take you? Like 220, something like that. How many good. times a week are you doing this kind of stuff? Well, here's a um, – you know what? You've got to do the strength stuff for ultras. You can't be uh, – like marathoners will go out and blow up on Leadville because the right. altitude and the, they're, they're expected to be able to run fast for – that long through that type of terrain in that in that altitude you just can't do it so you, you want to be fairly strong too so it's it's kind of a balance but run, my running coach david clark who's one of the coolest dudes i've ever met in my life you love david you need that guy on this podcast his story is freaking incredible i'm telling you he's just such an inspiration but he just wrote my workout for june um, going into july and it's it's pretty intense he's got uh one day is 11 miles of speed work so it's not just an 11 mile run you're doing speed work for 11 miles then the next day is the uh, incline workout where you're doing 10 incline on the treadmill at 4.2 miles an hour you're going to walk that fast because we're walking up mountains fast right and getting over them um, then the next day is three three mile runs which are one's level uh, at, at moderate pace the next one's at four percent incline pushing it hard the other one's all all out flat and then you take a day off then you run for three hours straight three hours straight and then you take a day off and you, so he calls that the sandwich the ultra sandwich and in the middle of that, we'll do an eight-hour run. And then at the end of it, we're going to do a 24-hour training run. 
and he's going to come out from Colorado to crew me for that because when you do a 24-hour run, you need fluids, you need food, yeah. you know, you're eating while you're moving, all that sort of stuff. The idea is just don't – it's called just perpetual forward motion. Just don't stop moving because once you do, your legs can seize up. I've sat down during long runs, and it gets, it gets ugly to get started again. So what are this guy's qualifications to be a running coach? Uh, he's finished, I think, 35 over 100-mile races. He finished the, uh, at least once I know of Badwater, which is, you know about Badwater? Nope. That's the 100-mile race, 135-mile race through Death Valley up into the mountains, 10,000 feet up into the mountains. Uh, you have to run on the white line so that your shoes don't delaminate and melt. He, he hallucinated for nine hours during that race. The white line on the side of the road that he ran on, opened up and had a mouth and talked to him for nine hours and told him how he didn't belong there and that he wasn't a world-class runner and couldn't finish. This is the kind of shit this guy does. He ran 48 hours straight for 188 miles for charity on a treadmill. Imagine that madness. This guy did 10, 10 massive events in one year and ran across the United States. How old is this guy? 46, 47. David Clark. He's, and he started out a 320-pound alcoholic. He's a bad ass. And now he's going to do his first MMA fight at the end of this summer for charity for the uh, charity that raises money for the Heron Project, which raises money for heroin addiction to, to get people uh, clean and so sober again. So you give him tips on his MMA? Yeah, endeavor. yeah, yeah. So when, every once in a while we're able to meet on the road. Yeah. He took me for uh, a workout just when I was over by Colorado Springs. We did the incline over there. You yeah. ever done that one? Nope. Holy shit. That's a rough one, buddy. Straight up. I mean, that's hardcore. Uh, but we did it twice back to back, and it's so easy for him. He's so efficient that he can he can literally go. He can do that stuff without even breathing what hard. What does he weigh? He's like 158 pounds, 160 what are you pounds. Walking out right now, probably 191. And, and you're 510. Yeah, you're yeah. you're pretty solid. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to. I'm just continually bleeding the weight off right now for the race. So I want to be. What do you want to weigh when? I got to be time? under under 180. I'd like to be 175. For the race. Okay, man, if you're going to do that workout you just told me, running 10 miles and doing 150 burpees, okay, and it's going to take you about 220, there's no telling how many calories you're burning just within that window and not throwing in just natural metabolism, uh, BMR, right. on top of that. So my question is, what are you doing for nutrition on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm slowly going more and more vegan, to be honest with you. I eat a little bit of meat still, mostly eggs for my protein if I'm going to get it from an animal source. Um, but... Uh, like David Clark, he's vegan. A lot of these guys, a lot of these great athletes, there's good, there's good MMA guys out there that are vegan. There's power lifters that are vegan. It's crazy. Um, but they say that, and I can feel it, that uh, your recovery is better. You're, you end up recovering better. And I'm a guy that, I'm telling you, man, I love a bone-in ribeye. I love it. But I can feel it, how it does slow me down, things like that, when I, when I eat it. You know what I mean? Are you using any kind of supplements like protein, any kind of whey protein to get some protein in your system? I won't use whey protein because it's the, it's the, it's the, dairy, it's the from dairy. Okay. So I now, like in my coffee, I'll use uh, almond milk, yeah. um, cashew milk, things like that. Yeah. Cause, because yeah, but there's not a shit pile of calories in that. Where are you going to book your calories from? Because all the activity you're doing, you should be 120 pounds. <laughs> I mean, in theory, yeah, calories yeah, in, yeah. calories out. Right. Well, I, you know what? I eat, like I say, I get a lot of, a lot of um, calories from eggs. I eat a lot of nuts. I eat a lot of you know, salads. I eat tons of avocados, all that type of stuff. So I'm, I, I pretty much am a human garbage disposal. I can eat anything. I've never eaten anything that I didn't like. So I, you know, I'm eating constantly. Trust me. You listening to kind of music? You know, I, here's the crazy thing. When I had the gluten thing going on, I wouldn't listen to music. It was noise to me. I hated music for years. Well, there's a lot of bands out there these days. Nothing about noise. <laughs> but I, now, you know, I, once I quit eating the gluten, my brain cleared up, and I suddenly realized that I liked music again. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so then uh, what would I find in your uh, Pandora uh, or your... Everything, or? everything from, I mean, Metallica to country to even, you know, I'll listen to uh, uh, some Sinatra, stuff like that. I like, I'm pretty, pretty varied, really, to be honest with you. Really am. Anything new these days? A lot of this new stuff I just don't understand, and I, I hate to sound like a stick in the mud, but I just don't get it. I'm just still kind of trapped back in the good old days of shit that was really good. Well, yeah, I mean, synthesizers and computers and all this stuff, the musicians, we're losing a lot of the musical talent out of it. I've never really liked to rap or anything like that because it just... Like I'm a white boy from Benton, Iowa. All right, I don't I don't communicate with bitches and in, in terms of bling and and my and my caddy and my curb feelers and shit and whatever. Not to not to say the obvious, but 
I, I never connected with me, right? Because right. that's not the way I lived. I drove a, a rusty old pickup truck and, and rustled in Iowa. So that's, you know, that's the way that was. But so most of the new stuff, I mean, uh, thankfully, one of my daughters, who's a really talented singer, likes country. So she'll say, Dad, will you put country on on the radio? Because I'm listening to Andrew Wilkow. Um, he's on Sirius XM 125 Patriot. Andrew Wilkow is the best radio host, talk radio host ever on the freaking planet in my mind. I've been on his show a couple times. Listen to that guy on, on Patriot Radio 125, Andrew Wilkow. He'll blow your mind. What did he talk about? I'll check it out. What was what he talk about? the same stuff I love to talk about, geopolitical and domestic policy stuff, and he will dismantle and destroy anyone who argues with him. He does it with facts. He's, I would never want to try and get in a debate and take an opposing stance on that with him um, because he's so good at it, and I love debate. I've, I've loved debating since, like I say, I was debating politicians about MMA and wrecking them, right? Right. Um, I would never even try to debate this guy. He's so sharp. He'd, he'd run me over like a truck. Hey, man, you got any funny uh, MMA fight stories? Because, I mean, for, for the most part, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's tactical stuff. It's strategic stuff. Uh, yeah, I've got a ton of – yeah, there's a lot of funny uh, stories. Like so, something that, you know, the, the, the vicious right hand, and the guy's not the same. But, I mean, uh, what we will, here, here's one. It, not, probably not in even, even your league. Went over to South Africa. And you know when you travel and you go into a different country, man, your diet changes, so your right. body changes a little bit too. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you get that new food. Man, it's kind of like you know when you switch your dog off one food to another. Right. It gives them shits. Yeah. Same thing with the human body. <laughs> yep. You probably noticed. <laughs> we were down in South Africa as I was wrestling a guy named Yokozuna. Yoko oh, yeah. weighed about 700 pounds. Right, massive. God dang, man, we was having a good match, and he was a wonderful Samoan guy. And he picked me up and slammed me, and when he did, I just shit myself. <laughs> and I said, God dang, I wore black trunks, <laughs> thankfully. Yes. And I told this, this uh, story with Chevella, you know, the voice versus the Stone Cold. Yep. Anyway, so he slammed me, I shit myself, and I'm thinking, you know, in the ring, when we got an issue, you know, you can say, hey, I, I looked at him and said, Yoke, when we want to go home and end the match, you know, we just say, hey, Let's go home. Yeah. I looked up at Yoke. I shit my pants. I said, Yoke, let's go home. And he goes, okay, bro. <laughs> so we did the finish, and I got the hell out of the ring and went to clean, to clean myself up. Is any kind of uh, just bullshit stories? Yeah. Um, you know, the funny stuff is when, I mean, even after something bad happens, like a guy gets knocked out, right? Right. Um, so Joe Dirksen's fighting Patrick Cote. Joe Dirksen used to come down and train with us constantly from Canada, right? And Patrick Cote is a, a French-Canadian yes. kid, tough, both tough guys. Yeah. Dirksen was an incredible grappler. Um, first round, early in the fight, Cote catches him with a punch and drops him, and he goes down. Um, Dirksen survives the first round, okay? Uh, they go out. Dir Dirksen's getting smashed around again by Cote. I think that, you know, they end up on the ground, goes to the third round. And Dirksen's taking more of a beating and ends up taking his back, though, and catches Patrick Cote with a choke with like a minute left in the fight or whatever it was. And so anyway, we get back to the locker room, and he comes in and he sits down and he looks at his hands and they got wraps on him. And he goes, did I just fight? And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, who did I fight? I said, you fought Patrick Cote. He goes, are you serious? I just fought Patrick Cote. I go, yeah. And he goes, what organization did we fight in? I said, the UFC, dude. And he goes, Holy shit, I fought Patrick Cote in the UFC. I go, yeah. And he goes, well, what happened? I go, well, he dropped you early in the fight. You were hurt, but you came back and you caught him with a choke. You beat him. And he goes, holy fuck. He jumps up. He's like, holy shit, I beat Patrick Cote in the UFC. This is fucking incredible. And then he looks at me and he goes, Pat Militich, how you been, man? I haven't seen you forever. I was, <laughs> and we were just dying, dying laughing in the locker room. And that same thing with Hughes. Hughes got knocked out over in Dubai, or not Kuwait. When he fought uh, Jose Pele Landy in an eight-man tournament, that's the holy grail of fight of UFC or uh, MMA fights. That tournament, if you can find a DVD of okay. that fight, everybody's looking for those, right? Because okay. it had uh, Dave Manet, uh, Carlos Newton, Jose Pele Landy, Matt Hughes, a guy named Barkaloff who was the scariest fucking man on the planet at the time. People are lucky he didn't make it to the UFC. I think because he was a Chechen terrorist, basically, he's a psychopath, right? And a couple other really tough Russians, right? It was the toughest eight-man tournament I've ever seen in my life. And Mane ends up winning that damn thing. He beats Barkalov in the championship. The Chechens, wanted to, they were going to try and kill us. The, but the Navy SEALs that were there got in the cage behind them. And so it was us and the Navy SEALs against the Chechens all of a sudden with all the sheiks sitting in their luxury couches, right? But anyway, Hughes got knocked out by Jose Pele Landy, and 
he, he was kind of a flash knockdown, I thought, you know. And, yeah. and Hughes was grabbing for his leg still, and John McCarthy steps in, stops it, and McCarthy's over there reffing. So he's walking Hughes toward me, and he's facing me like you are, McCarthy is, and Hughes is back to me, and John's kind of holding him up by his shoulders, walking him backwards. And I'm, I'm going, John, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you stopping the fight? I go, he was still trying for a takedown. And Hughes turns like this and looks over his shoulder at me. And he goes, what's going on? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, all right, good stuff. It's John. John looks at me. He goes, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So. God dang, I was watching. Uh, I thought it was one of your fights, one of Robbie's early fights. How long has Big John been around? He started with the very first one. And he was an L.A. cop, you know, yeah, for yeah. a lot of years. Uh, he's a tough son of a bitch himself. Yeah, I think he lives over for lunch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But he, he started with UFC 1. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm almost 100% sure. And they told him, don't stop these fights back then. Oh, really? Yeah. You let the butchery happen. Do not stop them. They have to tap out or they go unconscious. That's it. Hey, man, it was good talking to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. The podcast, one more time, because this is going to be on a different episode. Yeah, The Conspiracy Farm, and they can find it on YouTube. And then also, for anybody out there who's interested in law enforcement, military stuff, the uh, firehorsecombatives.com. And that's the bottom line, because Pat Middleton said so. God damn it, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody, give me to go home. Q's time to wrap up his podcast and ride off in the sunset and pack my bag so I can head down to Santa Barbara for a little bit of a vacation. Two-day vacation, but a vacation nonetheless. Hey, I want to remind you, coming up on this uh, next Thursday show, I'm going to start doing a segment with Wade Keller of the Pro Wrestling Torch. We will be shooting the breeze about the business of professional wrestling for about 10, 15, 20 minutes. Whatever it turns into, it's going to turn into. Man, that's how I run this show, so we'll see how it goes. But I will incorporate some time into the show as myself and Wade Keller from the Pro Wrestling Torch break down the current events of what's going on in the pay-per-view world, Monday Night Raw, and SmackDown. That is coming up starting next Thursday. Please check it out. Hey, man, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Alls has all them damn shirts I wore last season of Broken Skull Challenge. We're about to start filming a new season, so that means I'll have more new shirts coming out. And I got some doozies coming up this season. My beer is available at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in California. It's called Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA, and it's the best goddamn IPA in the United States of America. If you can't find it in Cali, check InsideTheCellar.com and see if they ship to your state. And as far as everything Steve Austin related, you can go to my website, BrokenSkullRanch.com. That includes the cold steel broken skull knife and the working man knife. i got to say one more time, thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin Show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. And you can find all my sponsors at podcastone.com. Just click on the Killer Deals button at the top of the page and then click on the Steve Austin Show banner. Hey, folks, keep listening. The 60-second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. California wildfires. I'm Tim McGuire with an AP News Minute. Wildfires are burning in both Southern and Northern California. James Cook, who lives in Santa Rosa in the state-celebrated wine country, says more than 100 of the mobile homes in a park he manages have been destroyed. It looks like a bomb went off. Nothing left. Some 1,500 buildings known to have burned. At least 10 people are dead. At least two wineries have been destroyed, many others damaged. Several homes have burned in a wildfire in Anaheim that covers about four square miles. The wife of an Allman Brothers Band founding member is serving a 30-day jail sentence for threatening members of a rowing team in Florida. News outlets report that 62-year-old Donna Betts, wife of guitarist Dickie Betts, is in the Sarasota County Jail after pleading no contest to aggravated assault with a deadly weapon without intent to kill. She had appointed a rifle toward about 100 teens and coaches from the Sarasota rowing crew. Her team is, her horse is right next to